I would like uh, to show you a video as an introduction for myself, and then we start with a topic what we can learn from water. Ich habe ja heute einen Alltag, der ganz viel mit Führung zu tun hat, der ganz viel mit Organisation zu tun hat. Mir hilft es dann, wenn ich mal erlebe, auch für mich selbst wieder etwas zu tun. Gerade beim Segeln, da ist auch ein Erlebnis dahinter für sich selbst. Wo sind denn meine Grenzen, wo sind meine Fähigkeiten, meine Möglichkeiten? Mein Name ist Andreas Enslin. Ich leite das Design Center bei der Firma Miele. Wir sind Premium-Hersteller. Das heißt für uns im Design, dass dieser Anspruch gegenüber dem Nutzer auch eingelöst werden muss, und zwar auch im Erlebnis. Man sieht das sehr schön, wenn es um wirklich ganz neue Produkte geht. Da bekomme ich eben keine intuitive Benutzung hin, wenn sich nicht jemand hinsetzt und es entsprechend gestaltet. Und dieses Gestalten einer Erfahrung, die macht Produkte überhaupt erst im Alltag nutzbar. Aber es ist eben auch anstrengend, ungewohnte Wege zu gehen, neue Wege zu gehen. Das hat auch viel mit Zeit zu tun, die man sich nehmen muss. Das ermöglicht mir nicht immer der Alltag. Da muss ich oft dann raus aus dem Büro, muss in eine andere Umgebung, die aber, wenn man ungewöhnliche Dinge tut, die auch, auch helfen, vielleicht die eigenen Grenzen ein bisschen weiter rauszuschieben. Ja, my name is Andreas Enslin. I'm director of the Miele Design Center. And uh, my connection to water uh, is that I, even as a child, uh, fast, uh, the water fascinated me. And uh, my first model ships uh, were made of waterproof painted cardboards from my father's shirt packaging. Uh, I did many experiments in the bus tube, uh, in fountains, lakes with model ships, with unusual drives, hulls, Uh, that could follow the nature of water better and better, the more I understood the soul of water. For me, water as a source of inspiration leads me to the introduction of two unusual landscape architects. Welcome on stage, Anuradha Mathe, who is an architect and uh, landscape an landscape architect who is professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture uh, at the School of Design, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Welcome on stage. Thank you. And uh, along with Philip Dacunia, welcome, an architect and planner who is co-director of the Risk and Resilience Program at the Graduate School of Design, Harvard University. Uh, and adjunct professor at the GSAPP Columbia University. Welcome, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah you're both your authors of uh, some books like Mississippi Floods mm -hmm. from 2001. Uh, you're Deccan Traverses, The Making of Bangalore's Terrain, 2006, and Soak Mumbai in an Estuary in 2009. You're co authors of Design in the Terrain of Waters. Um, I know, Radha Dilip, you are preparing an exhibition uh, entry right now, Ocean of Rain. This is a part of the exhibition Critical Zones in Karlsruhe at the ZKM. And in Germany, I think the next year in October, um, this shows in how a critical zone uh, in this planet now is. And uh, yeah, I think we have to understand much more about Uh, nature and the division, what we did, we have um, some uh, discussions before uh, in, our, in our mind, in our brain, between uh, water and land, and it's, it's very um, artificial what we are doing, mm -hmm. so we are, uh, as humans, yeah, we should not divide ourselves from nature, but we do it, uh, we, we make limits, we, we are drawing lines, we are dividing things because it's easier to handle and this is your topic, so I hand over uh, this to your presentation and uh, I'm, I'm very excited about to hear what you have to say. Please, <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas, for that uh, introduction.
And I also wanted to thank Paul for actually inviting us to Amsterdam to talk about water. Uh, I must say that it took us a little bit of mustering up our courage to come to the Netherlands and to talk about water. So it's, it was a provocation, but it was also a wonderful opportunity. Uh, what we will be doing today is that we will go back and forth, but I think there are roughly two parts to our presentation. In the first, we want to kind of establish a point of view. And I would say maybe it's another paradigm of thinking about water. And it may, may seem a little dry, you know, talking of watery language, uh, but I think it's quite important to sort of take a point of departure of why we are actually posing uh, this question between the difference between water and wetness. Uh, and in the second part, we will share with you some of the places and a glimpse of some of the projects that we have done in the past and we are involved in right now that actually really highlight why it's so important in the current milieu to start actually challenging our perceptions of water. And we are, we are interested in that because as designers, we feel that we have made an enemy of water even when we profess to be its friend. We separate it from land, we confine it to flows between riverbanks, to canals between edges, to pipes within sleeves. We incarcerate it in seas with, with coastlines, in lakes with edges, in reservoirs behind dams. We keep it out by designing increasingly impervious skin of buildings. So even when we design what we call nature-based interventions, we impose limits on it. We keep water to a place. But water erases boundaries and floods. It consumes coastlines with sea level rise. And in its confinement, it smells, froths, sickens, and kills with pollution. Water, it seems, wants to be free. Or perhaps water wants to be appreciated in its own terms as wetness. So we ask, what is the difference between water and wetness? Water is somewhere, whereas wetness is everywhere. It is in the air, it's in soil, it's in flora and fauna. It's right here, you kind of grab your hands and wetness is here. The sea is very wet and the desert is less so. In fact, there is no such thing as dryness. You know, when you think about, uh, I mean, you know, there, there is an apple would be about 86% wet, a cucumber maybe 96 and a prickly pear is 95, but we never think of calling them water bodies. And so in some ways, wetness is, aware, is everywhere in terms of its own gradients. It may be less or it may be more, but you can never be in a situation without wetness. Water drains off the land, gathering in designated places such as lakes and seas. Wetness, on the other hand, does not drain off the land. It soaks, seeps, blows, osmots, and in short, it transpires in ways that are ever-extending holdings of wetness. So it exceeds itself. So, you know, when we, what we see sometimes as flowing could be just wetness, you know, just reaching a point where it sort of flows beyond. In short, water flows, but wetness holds. Water is also the other in a land-centric world. It is placed to be in the service of land, to drain it, to power it, transport it, and provide it with waterfronts for real estate development. Wetness, on the other hand, is prior to this land-water binary. Okay, so what I want to do is actually just give you a sense of what the different... Uh, what what these different paradigms really are. Wetness and water, we say, are two paradigms. And in order to make the case for it, we want to use two rivers, at least what is familiar to us as two rivers, what is taught to us as kids as two rivers. One is the Nile, which is, of course, the quintessential um, river of the ancients, and the other is the Mississippi, which, uh, which I would say is a kind of classic model an exemplar of the moderns. But using these two examples, 
I want to suggest that there is an alternative that we don't see. And because we as designers, but even as, I guess, regular human beings, have been so educated to see these as rivers. So let us just look at one at a time. This is the Nile. Okay, and one of the, at least in ancient times, this is an old map that, uh, that speaks to two elements, actually, that you see on the left side, two elements. One is the Nile at a certain time, that is the narrow line that you see in the middle, the two lines that you see in the middle, which is the Nile between, I would say, October and May. But between June and September, at least this is how the ancient pre-Socratics Greeks saw it, it was between two deserts. So the pre-Socratics, led by Thales, the first natural philosopher, asked this question, which is the normal Nile? Is it the one between, between you know, June, July, and I mean, or I would say October and, and May, or is it the one between, between June and September? Now, I say that's like asking, you know, which is the normal dilip, when I breathe in or I breathe out? But that question, is so significant to defining what is normal because then you have defined flood. So flood is nothing but water crossing a line. So when we define a river like the Nile, you've also conceived of a concept of flood that, that we as experts then come to resolve. Now this is something that the Egyptians never saw. They never saw flood. And why? Because they never saw a river to begin with. So when the Greeks asked the Egyptians, why does the Nile flood, they got no answer. So if you think about it, if you move to the right now, the image on, your, on the right side, that is a hieroglyphic that begins to suggest why they did not see flood. Because they did not see water in a flow between two lines. They saw it actually rising from underneath which is the way in which so many people across the world actually see water. They don't see it in a flow, but see it as water that rises and falls. So what you have now are two paradigms of habitation. And we as designers are educated only to the one on the left, which is, if you look at the, at the, lower, the lower margins over here, you will see actually that you see water within two lines that are now become levees. And this, is, and this country actually has mastered this art, actually, of channeling, channeling waters and, and, I would say, keeping waters out of land, you know, with barriers, which, of course, they're learning to dismantle now, which is the, which is the diagram on the right side, where you, see, where you see water, actually, that is appreciated as rising and falling. So the Egyptians knew, actually, that the source of this was rain, and they looked at the Nile as rain, not as a river. You know, but this needs a lot of undoing. Now, this is the Mississippi in 1927, and you see two high grounds. On the left side, you see a high ground of a levee, which is a line that separates water from land. This is what the European settlers saw. But the Native American was looking to the right. They lived on mounds. So living on mounds, allowing water to be free, is a very different paradigm from the left side, where you contain water to a channel in order that land be free. So what you have is this, then. You have a line that fails, I mean flows, and then fails in flood on the left side. And here you have a line that is a horizon that actually marks a rise and fall of wetness. So these are two very, very different paradigms and lead to very different approaches to design. But the question that it raises for us is how has wetness that is everywhere, it's in the air, as Anu said, you know, it's in us, it's everywhere, how has it become water between two lines? You know, so how is one paradigm led to another? And why is it that today we are feeling the need, even though we don't acknowledge it, to, ignore, to come back to wetness from water? So the first way by which water is, I should say wetness will remain to water, is by choosing a time. So the way in which you look at time is through the hydrologic cycle. Now just to quickly remind you what you probably all studied in school, you know, that the water circulates. And to give you a better drawing, actually we look at Paul Clay. This is Paul Clay's drawing actually, the Bauhaus, um, of the water cycle. And it's remarkably simple, but it is also how every child learns how to draw the water cycle. So number one is precipitation, two is flow, flow formation, 
Three is evaporation, and four is cloud formation. So that's the way water is, water is appreciated as, as circulating. What we want to suggest, actually, is that we have made one moment in this cycle into our time of reality. We inhabit this one moment. And in this moment, we draw a line to separate what is above from what is below, so we have a geographic surface. And then we divide land from water. I shouldn't say we divide land from water. We divide wetness and create land and water. So that act of creation is an act of design, which we all do. And it is more than architects that do this. It's actually all of us on, on Earth, to some extent, are trained to do this. It's a particular design literacy. So what you have now is land that is not water and water that is not land. And that is why we are distancing ourselves from the term water, because it comes with a binary structure. So this is where we appreciate wetness as a prior condition that is not divided to begin with. So what we have in this moment, we have constructed maps. So we, you know, if you ask the question, why does a surveyor not go out when it's raining to draw maps? They wait for the rain to pass before they can actually go out. Why? Because they don't see a line between land and water when it's precipitating, when it's hurricaning, when it's, you know. So you wait for that in order to draw maps. So we wait for this moment. Then you look at Google Earth. We all work with Google Earth maps today, right? But this is not the map that they work with. They wait for the clouds to pass before they can actually draw the Earth or, you know, map the Earth, which means that all our maps are actually moments in time that are gathered together. So there is a time that has been made static. And this temporality, actually, that is lost is something that is coming to haunt us today with sea level rise and climate change and things like that. And we want to come to that later. But just remember this, actually, what it means to construct space without time. So we have taken time away from our space, basically. The second way by which wetness has been made water is by drawing a line. This drawing a line, now there are many lines that, we, that we're all familiar with as architects, you know, that we use, you know, we use the lines for hashes, contours, alpha writing our alphabets. You know. I'm not talking about any of these lines. I'm talking about a very particular line, and that is this line. This line separates land from water. It separates land from sea on the left. It separates and constructs a river. And how does it do that? It is by drawing a line of separation, and this line of separation also is a line of calibration, because that's the way I see a flow in a river. It is also a line of containment. I attribute to this line the possibility of containing water to a place. So with this literacy of the drawn line, I do not actually need to see a line, because line, as Euclid you know, sort of defined it, is basically a breathless length. It's only length and no breadth. That's an idea. It's a design idea, a beautiful invention that, you know, unfortunately was not patented. But if you just think about what it had, I mean, what if it had, we would all be paying huge amounts actually to use a line. But that line doesn't appear to everybody. You know, the aborigines in Australia or the natives in, 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 in North America did not know of this geometric line that had no breadth. So when we draw a line, we don't see it. We only see land and water on either side. So with that ingenious invention, and together actually with our choice of time, what we have now is basically an enemy in water that we have created by design. We have designed water to be our enemy. So what does it mean to acknowledge this design and then ask if we can solve today's problems of climate change, sea level rise, floods, you know, and water riots, etc., using the same paradigm that created these problems. Shouldn't we look for a new paradigm in design? So what we suggest, actually, is to take a look again at the cycle and ask, do we need to inhabit moment two in the cycle and then construct a geographic surface, or do we inhabit a hydrologic cycle in and of itself? And then hydrologic cycle that I want to point out to you is between clouds and aquifers. So... While one hand, you know, if you, if you think about it like this, let me give you an example of how to think about this. When rain comes, this is what happens in, in the two cases. In the first case on the left, the rain falls on a geographic surface. It forms into flows, and then we understand water as flowing off the land into the sea as a place of, as a place of gathering or a lake as a place of gathering. So a surface and flows, that's how we see rain. If you look at the paradigm on the right, the, the rain falls, but it doesn't fall to a surface. 
It just increases a wetness that is already everywhere between clouds and aquifers. So if you think about it like this, that, it's, that this is where, it, I mean, where wet rain inhabits a zone, a critical zone between, between clouds and aquifers, this is, not, this is not an ocean that is outside of a geographic surface. This is what we call an ocean of rain, which is what Andreas referred to as, what, as an exhibition that we are working on, and we'll, we'll show you some examples of that. And that sense of section, of inhabiting a section, makes us work much more in section than in plan. As architects, we've been educated to think through plan and incorporate a section. What is it actually to work with section first and then move into plan? We'll show you a couple of examples, a couple of examples of that. But this is what it means to inhabit ubiquitous wetness rather than a geographic surface, you know, and then operate in some way in this zone that then is concentrated where we are, but there is no surface. So this is the exhibition that we're working on, which builds on this distinction between a geographic surface and an ocean of rain with India as an example. So we are so used to actually looking at India as a river landscape, you know, and looking at, I guess, the whole earth as a river landscape, whereas what we are suggesting actually is to inhabit an ocean an ocean of rain. So the exhibition is to give you some examples of how that exhibition. This is the middle, the middle one is a photographic experience that we have recorded in place. If you move to the left, it is that geographic surface where we are individuating objects. We all work with architecture, buildings, things. It's so interesting actually to see architecture played out over here. There's so much about building, you know? And so we assume actually the objectness of the world you know, so we work with rivers, we work with, I think we look inside, we work with outside, that sort of thing. Whereas on the right, there's much more of a sense of a negotiated world where you do not make a distinction to begin with and you operate in ways that are very, very different. Uh, this is a detail of the same um, experience on the, on the Ganges, on the Ganges River. You know, in a, time of, in a time of fog, this is a moment of fog and fog lifts. It can afford clarity, but on the other hand, it doesn't have to afford clarity. It affords a negotiated moment um, by which you operate. With much more than your eyes, you operate with all your senses, not just with your eyes where you need that clarity of things. So the idea here is how to think about design without the privileging of the eye and allowing that to be the queen of the senses. Why can't we operate with much more, uh, much more of our being? Another example of the streets. I mean, there was a conversation this morning that we that experienced on the street, not just being, you know, a place for a place for traffic, but about being something, being something more. And it's always something more in India, particularly, you know. So, where, when you have our design initiative is to break down streets and single out the objects and then construct mixed uses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is it not to accept the, the the separation of uses to begin with? to work through an operation of, of, uh, of uh, much more of a relativism rather than an absolutism of, that is equivalent of drying and wet. So what Dilip was just showing you is really work in progress. So these are not finished drawing, maybe they will never finish, but they are sort of working and, and the negotiating of the stains is almost analogous to our looking at the landscape. What we'd like to just share with you briefly is some of the places that we have actually, you know, been engaged in more recently and some of the work we've been doing. And oh, well, let me go back to that. So we've been actually spending a lot of time in the Sundarbans, uh, which, you know, we have some people here from Calcutta. You'd be very familiar with that. Um, it is, the, you know, it is known as the delta of the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. And we make a distinction that when you look at it, what is the difference between looking at it as a delta versus looking at it as an estuary? So the moment you look at it as a delta, you start to distinguish between channels and islands. And that's what's, what's happened, very similar to this particular landscape, where there's a certain kind of polarization of actually sort of distinguishing that this is land and this is the path of the river. In an estuary, the sea is very much already within. And these are some historical maps and also diagrams in which we, we sort of just trying to call out that when you think of it as an estuary, you don't exclude the sea and it's not right at the end. 
But the consequence we find as you travel through these landscapes is that these distinctions of the islands are not just made because of the maps, or let's say the maps precede the territory, if one had to say. And there are a whole series of embankments which are built around these islands. And within one day, you will find that the tide would go 15 feet up and down. And so there's an extreme vulnerability that is built in because of this distinction. <coughs> but if you had to start thinking of it as an estuary, there is much more of a thinking about, as Dilip mentioned, that it's a really about high ground and low ground, about tide and rain. It's a sectional understanding. And we have traveled through these parts and we see that these levees from being just mud levees, which local people could actually even repair, are becoming higher, are becoming concrete, are becoming firmer. So there is a whole trajectory that in order to sort of fight some of these issues of climate change, of weather patterns changing, we have to actually polarize further. We have to actually make this firm. And in some ways, we think that we have to actually return to wetness, where we're looking at the mangroves, we're looking at the aquifers, we're looking at the clouds as part of the sectional world. And how do you actually start to make it much more open and live within it? On the other extreme, I think wetness actually has taken us to the desert. These are the deserts of Northwest India, the Thar deserts of Rajasthan. And it's really a place of sand and scrub. And you know, the government sees it as dry lands, that there is nothing here, that actually it, it is something which is without quality. And you'd still, you know, when you travel there, you'll find that there are a whole number of systems by which rain is actually held within this landscape and how people live. And they're very subtle, but they actually sort of make it a, what they call one of the liveliest deserts in the world. But when you start thinking that it's a place of nothing, this is what's happening today, that we are bringing in water in rivers or actually concretizing what are actually just seasonal sort of flash floods or seasonal flows. And we are going far and wide, like we're going all the way like 500 miles to bring water into the desert to the point that we have people actually growing rice where there is, you know, uh, in a place which is sort of has less wetness, but is not something that can accommodate rice growing. So it opens up practices that become indulgent in a way that completely sort of destroys the kind of ecology and the subtle topography and subtle sort of nuances of the desert. So when we started to work and move into this area, we were much more fascinated about how rain actually had imprints in this landscape uh, and rain and the, and the southeast monsoons, whether it is through the dunescapes, whether it's through a whole system of making salt, which relies completely on the monsoons, or it's certain practices of you know, certain fairs and people working in these washes, coming at the times when there is no water and when there is water. And it is a much more of a maidan-like field. It's an open field that is not actually enclosed into entities where it's only one use or the other. So in the other one, there's either water there or there's no water. And here there are people who actually live in these washes and there are a whole number of practices. And this is just a, you know, a glimpse of a proposal in which it is actually engaging a whole system of holdings in which the infrastructure is not about managing the river, but it's as much to do with the sewage, it's as much to do with rain, to do with places for craftspeople, a place for um, sort of allowing some of these temporary fairs to actually come and go. We wanted to just touch on a project uh, or work that we began in Mumbai, which was almost a decade ago. And I think the first time we ever spoke at, I think, the World Architecture Festival many years ago, this was just hot off the uh, you know, hot off the table. But we have been quite involved here and we find that what's been remarkable is that a place like Bombay has more and more, and it's even in its marketing, in its image, sort of thinks of itself as the island city. And when you call yourself the island city, what you're really doing is that you're separating land, the island, from the sea. And even the, you know, the beautiful map on the left, which is a you know, uh, 1900s map, has a lot of detail in the cadastral sort of information, but the sea has very little to say. So the plan view tended to sort of erase the sea out and only focus on land. And when we started to work on this project, we started to think of it in section. And these are some of the early beginnings of a certain sectional world, where we felt the section was really more a negotiation between tide and rain. And so we really sort of think about the first image on the left 
as Bombay as an island, and on the right as Mumbai in an estuary. Because estuary is a place, even though you think there is no water inside Bombay, the estuary is always within. And every time it rains, the estuary actually appears. And I think very recently, New York Times had these whole series of maps for many cities in the world, and Mumbai was one of them, of what would happen in 2050. And we find it was really nothing more than the estuary claiming itself. And of course, when we began you know, working on this project, we were very concerned because there had been some major, you know, now of course there's almost a flood every year that it rains. And the question to us was how did something that was actually a gift become actually such a big problem? That today Bombay seemed to be a dangerous place in flood. And it's really this sort of image of black, what you see there, where even topography is raised. It's not only the literal cut and fill that has happened in Mumbai, but it's really the image that it's all about land and land values and land, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's real estate. And we find this island, this is not only within the larger sort of sense of it, it's between looking at what is green and brown, it's looking at a site, it's site plans within, you know, whether it's a river or a not river. And so our sort of move, and I'm not going to get into detail about the project, was really starting to walk the city, but starting to see the city in section. And we found that in section, there was many ways to start to accommodate the estuary through sort of cut and fill, through holding systems, through also bringing in some of the practices that sort of work with this rhythm. So like what you see here are these you know, boats which come up every monsoon. And more and more, there is no place for these kinds of practices that are very tied to the very essence of Mumbai. And of course, when we were working on this, even though we have developed this project in many other <clears> ways, <throat> it really began as a book and an exhibition. And actually, the public exhibition has very much been a part of the way our practice actually works, where it's not about only showing solutions to what is possible in a problem. We are really involved in actually opening up a new imagination. And so when we looked at this particular project, we said, you know, it was called Soak. And Soak was about making peace with the sea, about designing in the monsoon with the estuary. More recently, and I would say, you know, recently is, it's not very recent, but it was when uh, 2012, when Sandy, the hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of the United States. Uh, there was interesting moments where engineers were calling in designers to actually work with them to start rethinking, how do we think about resilience? And it was an interesting moment because, you know, all this kind of infrastructural work is really the part of engineers and designers really don't have a voice in it. And to be brought onto the table was sort of interesting. But what we found is that most of the designers' jobs seem to have become just beautifying infrastructure or you know, making levees with functions or doing nature-based systems. But we realized that actually it was a much deeper issue here. And actually, as you see the Washington Post, I mean, you know, Norfolk, which is one of the places we were looking at on Virginia coast, is struggling between rising waters and sinking options. It's one of those few places where there has been a lot of subsidence, or let's say the sea has actually risen almost eight inches in about uh, 20 years, which is a lot. But it's not only because of the sea rising, it's also because of a geological uh, sort of uh, sinking of the ter territory. Not as much as what this country is facing, but still quite extreme. And so rather than starting to just give solutions for sites or trying to barricade them, we actually looked at the whole idea of the coast or what would be the coastline. And the impulse is to reinforce the coastline, whether you, re, you know, reinforce it through layered defenses or you reinforce it through strong defenses. And when you actually look at the coast of Virginia, you realize that there is so much movement that goes across. There are, you know, there's fish, there's boats, there are creatures, there are all kinds of movements across. And so what would it actually be to not look at it as a line this direction, but to start think of it, thinking of it as gradients in the other. And so we, again, sort of this whole idea of starting to think in section, the coastline is a very, it's not a line, it's a coast, but it's a very different entity. And sort of beginning from there, where would it actually take us to even defining a project on a particular site? So for us, actually reframing the question, reframing the imagination was as important as giving actually a design solution. Um, and, what, and when we looked around, as designers and as landscape architects and architects, we found that actually the whole Chesapeake or the east coast of America is actually 
working with this kind of fractured nature. And we actually coined the term fingers of high ground at that time. So these are things which could be designed, but it is also found in nature in a sense that the whole coastline you know, breaks up into creeks and into rills. And, but there are also sort of many found conditions, whether they're geological, there are highways being raised all the time, which are actually high ground, there are ridges themselves, and there are all kinds of sort of uh, sites which can be made elevated because of their conditions. And so we started to look at this whole array of territories. And just as a diagram, you know, what the, you know, what, uh, what the axonometric is showing is that there are two gradients in operation here, one from the sea to the land and one from land to sea. And how can we actually start thinking of design and time? Time of a project being implemented, but even time of what uses sort of start working in what territories. Uh, and just to play out an idea, just very quickly, this is actually you're seeing the environments of a place called Norfolk, which is very strategic in the United States. It has the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy actually situated right here. So it's of great importance to the United States. But one sort of scenario is on the top, which is, okay, you can keep building levees, even complex levees, levees within levees, and you start building a closed system. And what would it be if you started to actually think about it as a series of fingers which built on some of the existing high grounds, you know, which are very subtle. Today, they would go under uh, highways and other places. Um, and, and, and also to start thinking of a project that grows incrementally. I won't get into much details because I know we're going to be running out of time very quickly. But this is a particular coal pier, which is sort of also a post-industrial site, which is in transformation. And we sort of try to demonstrate how an idea which is starting from a reframing of the coast could actually play out. And the project has many parts to it, which actually goes not along the coast, but goes into the interior, you know, from actually starting to attenuate waves and sort of, sort of work with sort of the low grounds to actually starting to hold rain in the higher grounds. So it is sort of seems counterintuitive, you know, because the whole idea is for engineers is to drain water off the land as fast as possible. And here the whole project was about holding. And when you look at these sections, you realize that sometimes the subtle is, uh, the, the section change is very subtle. It doesn't have to be massive mounds to be built. And there is actually a lot of soil in this area. Um, and this is another project, which is, we, I won't go into the details, but this is a place where there is a sort of a housing, but this is a major highway which is being trans change because it's 50 years old and has to be rebuilt. And can that actually take off a whole settlement, which is only sort of people are only moving laterally. They're not being asked to retreat from the area. But it works with existing piers, with new wetlands and the housing sort of, sort of working on these fingers. And as I mentioned that there's a lot of soil in this area because there is, this is the whole shipping lane. So there is actually dredging happening. So how can a sort of a material sensibility and so in terms of quality and quantity, you have every type of material you can find. And can that be actually the first project? That can we actually start to work with the soil and transform it and use it, whether it's for using the reforestation, whether it's for housing, whether it's for building, for making concrete, whatever the uses are. And ultimately, the project was really about actually rain and tide. Because in these areas, you'll find that even local people, when you talk to them, they are getting flooded, not so much because of the sea is coming in. They are getting rained out. The rain is backing up. And so when we look at all the modeling, the sort of very sophisticated computer modeling which are happening, they are really dealing with modeling the ocean, the seas, and the rising seas. And we find there's very little possible also because it, the interior of cities are so complex, of very little of rain being modeled. And rather than saying, okay, we have to wait till rain is modeled, there is a lot of common sense as designers that we have to use. So our work is really working between starting to understand rain from very basic principles that that's what we have to deal with when we are actually starting to deal with sea level rise. So then we actually called our project Turning the Coast. And yeah, and we're turning a lot more than just the coast. I mean, you can see that. But uh, just want to end with one with one thought now. That we, since we started with this kind of question, does water want to be free? Uh, I think we should go further than that. It's not about water wanting to be free alone, but it is the need for us all to inhabit ubiquitous wetness and thereupon you know, design a new paradigm. So we're calling on architects to begin to think of their role in the world today, because I think. 
more than ever, they are needed you know, for, this, for, for the kind of problems that we face today. We need a new imagination, and architects are uniquely equipped, actually, to, to deal with the possibilities of a new imagination. And so to call them to be leaders in our current crisis, actually, and we are seeing this, actually, where engineers are turning to, turning to architects, and we, we want to embrace that possibility and, um, and, um, and, uh, yeah, and, and draw architects' attention to this, uh, to this great opportunity of not just continuing to design what we've always designed, you know, and uh, to, to think about what it might mean, uh, what it might mean to inhabit wetness and reconstitute the very disciplines that uh, our society is sort of built upon and encouraged to, to divide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very great, thank you. Um, we should take yeah. a couple of minutes yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to have a discussion mm -hmm. about what you have uh, shown. Please take a seat. Mm -hmm. I think for the, for the audience, it's uh, interesting to see your fantastic work here. And uh, behind uh, all this is a, a difference in thinking. You mentioned it several times. Uh, this division between wetness and water, it's a, a, th a kind of thinking, it's a design topic at least. And um, when, when I see your presentation, uh, it comes to my mind, what does it mean for the future? So when, when we see we have this uh, CO2 problem, we have the climate change, mm -hmm. um, and we are here in the Netherlands, yeah? so Netherlands is, is mm -hmm. really uh, uh, affected by, the, by this, by the rise of the sea level mm -hmm. more and more. So we, we took, as humans, we took centuries uh, to divide uh, nature from humans. And I think now it takes centuries to bring this back, to merge this again, uh, especially when you are, as a landscape architect, when you are working. So you, you know it, it takes time when nature um, uh, reacts on the things we are doing. And we as people, as humans, yeah, we as well need some time. So you mentioned uh, in your speech the Hurricane Sandy, mm -hmm. and this shows immediately the impact uh, of, uh, yeah, it shows all the limits of humans. Mm -hmm. So what we did wouldn't work really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And now uh, it is time to change something. Could you talk uh, a, a little bit about wh what you think, what we have to do, what is necessary now? So maybe you, you start. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yes. That's I think uh, that's the challenge actually that we that we face. But if I can put it a, a slightly differently, perhaps from what we described, mm -hmm. is one of the things we ask our students that uh, you know when we inhabit a geographic surface and design architecture as we design it today, or landscape architecture as we design it today, we're generally seeing, for example you know, the possibility of designing and then having the hurricane come. So mm -hmm. we design in order to withstand the hurricane. We design in order to withstand the storm, mm -hmm. you know, to... Uh, instead of thinking like that, what we should be designing is in the hurricane. We should be designing in the storm. Now that would mean actually inhabiting the cycle. Mm -hmm. So we're inhabiting the cycle and not inhabiting a surface and, and accommodating, you know, as you call it, nature as coming mm -hmm. from beyond. So this immersing of design uh, will, is just the start, because then you move to also start thinking like, you know, that it is not about just the project on the ground. It is also an educational agenda mm -hmm. that we have to impart. So we are constantly working not just as projects, we're also, as you saw, doing public exhibitions. And so that sensibility of carrying the public with us rather than designing for the public is also another, you know, a kind of corollary, if you will, mm -hmm. of this uh, approach. Uh, what do you think? Maybe I would give, yeah. a sl you know, uh, another sort of angle to this is, mm -hmm. we are acutely aware that what we are talking about, there is a transition needed. Mm -hmm. So many of these projects are really not, you know, it's, a, it's not that today we are here and tomorrow we can be there. We realize that many of them need a certain time but, mm -hmm. but like when we were working in Norfolk and some of these sort of, uh, you know, fingers of high ground that we, you know, demonstrated, mm -hmm. we realized that there were places that needed levees in the short term. And so we were designing these fingers in a way that there could be levees in the short term, but in the longer term, 
they had a chance to transition to a more open system. So, and even like when we worked on the Mississippi, uh, we would sort of always say that, you know, can we design as if there are no levees? We know they are there, they're needed for the time being. And so I think there is also a sense of like, how do we actually make these transitions? And, and it's something which we don't feel that we have to give all the answers, but if people start to think this is an important question, there would be a lot of creativity coming. How do you make those transitions? Mm -hmm. Do you see that there's really an influence? Do you feel an influence on the engineers, uh, even on the government? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do, we, do, do you feel that there's a change in thinking? You know, it's, it's difficult to say because, you know, I mean, there are two sort of, two anecdotes I remember when we were working with the Army Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. in the US. One of them was, one of the engineers described that, you know, he was of course very invested in it and his department. Mm. But he said, it's like taking a huge boat and trying to move it with little paddles. You know, that was one- <laughs> An aircraft carrier. A aircraft carrier and trying to move <laughs> it with little, little okay. paddles. That was one. The other was that we were doing a workshop organized by the engineers and one of the sort of the heads of sitting in Washington told all his engineers that, you know, what you are looking at right now is not what is intuitively, mm. you know, you you'd sort of agree with but be open because it is a time that we need to shift a paradigm. Mm. So we've seen both these kinds of conversations, uh, but it takes a long time, you know, it takes a mm. long time. So we don't know whether it takes a disaster or it takes just chipping away at a mindset, mm. but uh, it's difficult to say whether the mindset has changed mm. yet. Yeah. But unfortunately we are running out of time. Yes. So uh, running it out of time is what I see here, unfortunately. Yeah. So many thanks for your impressive work, uh, Anwarda and Dilip, and uh, ho hopefully it will help to change our view uh, of ourselves, our world around us, and to make it a little bit better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.